for those of the viewers that, that may not know you, tell us just a little summary about yourself. Uh, I'm a professional voice actor. I have been for 20 years. I've been on hundreds of shows. Uh, some of the bigger ones these days are like Guardians of the Galaxy, where I play Rocket Raccoon, or Emperor Palpatine on Lego Star Wars. Uh, hopefully he has another life, because we understand the Emperor's in the new movie, so that could be good news for old Super Lego Emperor. about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that and F is for Family on Netflix and My Little Pony, a whole bunch of characters on that, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, I've been in L.A. for six years. I'm Canadian. I, I was in Vancouver for 15 before that. Mm -hmm. That's where I started my voiceover career. And, uh, yeah, I, I was a closet, secret closet gamer my whole life. <laughs> um, because back in the 80s, you didn't talk about this. This was not something that you advertised. It was, there was this, there was this shame yeah, it's <laughs> weirdly like, associated it's like, with it. Uh, Trevor, are you doing drugs? Oh, no. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm playing RPGs. No, I'm actually, I'm doing drugs. Yeah, exactly. But uh, it's amazing to me how the culture is completed now. Like it, it's not only mainstream, it's like super hip. And I'm like, what is going on? This is so bizarre. But I thought, oh, what the hell? I'll just dump, jump in and uh, out myself on my own show. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> that that actually dives right into my first question about RPGs, which was, let's go back to basics. When did you start playing RPGs? Well, I, <clears throat> as far back that I don't remember. And I, I'm, I think it was 1979 or 80, somewhere around there. And I, I was very young, but I remember very clearly going over to my friend, Jason Peters. He lived down the street <clears throat> and, um, it was just me and him in his, in his parents' basement. And he pulled out this game, this AD and D. And I was like, what is that? And I just fell in love <clears throat> with the cover art of the monster manual and the player's handbook and the DMG right away. Uh, that old Errol Otis artwork, I was just immediately, what is this? This is the greatest thing ever. And he ran me through the village of Hamlet. And I played Black Black Jay, who was a paladin. And I remember I, I made the paladin because he was the closest thing to a knight. And I thought, well, that's what you have to be is a knight, right? And I didn't have a name. He said, what's your name? And I'm like, Trevor. He said, no, 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 your character's name. And I was like, character's name? I don't know how to answer that. So he flipped to the village of Hamlet and randomly picked a name of one of the NPCs there, whose name was Black J. And he said, okay, well, you're Black J. I said, okay. So I was Black J. And he, Black J, became my, like, number one principal character. I ran him off and on for, like, 12 years. It was it was crazy. Uh, <clears throat> but hilariously, years later, when I went back to the village of Hamlet as a GM, and I was like, oh, look, <laughs> Black J. Oh, he's some sort of hunter. Oh, well, that's <laughs> no good. I like him better when he's a paladin. But, yeah, so it all started way back then, and I, I just I fell in love, like, immediately with it. And then over the years, I sort of quickly outgrew D&D &D when I realized there was a whole other world of, of games out there. Uh, so I jumped into all kinds of stuff, Traveler and RuneQuest and Warhammer Fantasy. When that came out in 88, I think, I was immediately like, this is my jam. This this sort of, you know, you think you're playing D&D, &D, but it's actually Call of Cthulhu. That is absolutely <laughs> my jam. That's like, you know, <clears throat> it turns out to be a horror movie in disguise. So I ran that successfully for many years, several campaigns with different groups all over and always just like, just so great. But uh, yeah, these days, um, at the moment, I'm playing in a Mithras game that my buddy from back home is running, which is like RuneQuest 6. Uh, I was running a one ring campaign for six years. We wrapped that up last year to amazing, amazing climactic aplomb. Uh uh, what else? Oh, I'm running a, a five edition, a fifth edition right now, which I just started um, with a couple of people here in town. Uh, so the, yeah, it's 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 cool. There's a lot of irons in the fire, and this thing has sort of taken up all my my creative oxygen over the past little while because I didn't realize what a mammoth undertaking it actually was. I thought, oh, well, I'll just do a little show, but I was like, no, no, I have to have six cameras and full sound effects, and I have to <laughs> edit it like a professional. So yeah, it takes a lot of a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that, that's probably also uh, uh, an issue in which your technical background and your expertise of being a voice actor has probably helped you. Well, I guess uh, I suspect the audio is probably the weakest element of my show. To tell you the truth, well, I, would say I don't so. know. I, uh, it. Uh, I, I haven't edited. I used to be a filmmaker. I was a filmmaker back in the late '90s, and I haven't been around an editing suite in all that time. And it is 
so I, I, you know, I bought Final Cut Pro 10 uh, when I started this project because I was like, oh, well, I have to edit something or something to edit on. And I pull up this program and, you know, for a guy that hasn't edited in 20 years, it, I felt like a, a dinosaur because I remember I shot a film back in 96, I think it was, 97. And I said to my editor, <clears throat> okay, this is what I want for the opening titles. I want a lens flare to come behind the words. And he went, ooh, I don't know. Okay, that could be so 12 hours later, I had it. And this, I open up Final Cut, and there's literally a drag and drop. Oh, lens flare, boom, done, done. Just like that. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I've, I've missed a lot. Yeah, things have changed, definitely. Wow. So getting into the, the solo part of it, because that's where most of the audience probably is going to come from, um, how did you discover Mythic, the, the Mythic Game Master Emulator? I stumbled across it, and I can't even remember where, but I, I'm always, always, always on the hunt for the new shiny, <clears throat> like all, always, always. So I'm on Drive Through RPG all the time, and I'm reading reviews on all the various forums and stuff, and if I see something that's like, oh, that's interesting, I'll just immediately buy it, because, <laughs> you know, why not? So I stumbled across this mythic thing, and I was like, GM emulator, that sounds crazy. Uh, so I, I was intrigued, and <clears throat> when I read it, I immediately realized that it was a tool that I could use for running my own games. I didn't actually look at it as a solo uh, th a thing at all. I looked at it like this is a fantastic way for me as a GM to go into a session with my players mm -hmm. and not have to know anything about what's going to happen. Because back in the old days when I was a young GM, uh, you know, like a lot of us back in the 80s, I, I sort of got swept up at this idea of epic stories that have to be told a certain way. And it was basically just railroading people down a, a GM story path, right? Which when the 90s came, I was like, yeah, that bores the hell out of me now. Because uh, as a GM, I don't want to know what's going to happen. And so when this emulator came along, I was like, oh, well, this is perfect. Now I can literally just I don't know what's going to happen, guys. Let's see. So it was a tremendous uh, <clears throat> tool for that. And also, for developing adventures because the emulator allows you to basically uh, plan through a module that you're creating essentially with all of the different branches that the players could go. And, and I ran, I did that the first time for a world of darkness game that I ran back in Vancouver and it worked out so well. I was like, this, this thing is fantastic. I mean, it's just a great tool. So yeah, it's like, yeah, it, it was never really designed for me to sit down and play by myself even though that's sort of the the principal you know draw of it, it was it was always just a tool for me to run at the table. The reason why I use it for this <clears throat> is because, uh, I mean, the whole gimmick of the show is that it's just me doing this thing. So I thought, well, I need to have, well, I need to have the emulator. I need <laughs> to have some tool to to surprise myself, and that's exactly what this thing does. That that's very interesting and very cool because the uh, the fact that Mythic improves your GMing because it it. Uh, adds a surprise factor to your games, uh, even as a GM. It's something that I've sort of discovered and, and distilled as, I, as I've played and, uh, and as I've used it for my games, for my like social games. But it's very cool that you arrived the first and then went to the solo part. I would say that you're probably like the outlier there, but, but it's, it's great because that's one of the things that I, I think that it's probably undiscovered from the uh, Mythic Game Assimilator and in general uh, being able to play solo, that it actually improves your GMing. I got to tell you, I didn't even know solo RPG was a thing uh, <laughs> when I read when I read the, the emulator and it was talking about, oh, play by yourself. And I was like, what are you talking about? Play by yourself. This is a game you play with friends. Hello. <laughs> but uh, uh, but now now I see that there's this whole community. And I got to tell you, like I said, I didn't do this show because I wanted to I wanted to champion the cause of the solo RPG. I barely knew there was a solo RPG community when you wrote me and said, hey, yeah, you know, we're part of this group. I'm like, there's a group of solo. Play really? There's more than one. How it's does that yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. No idea. So it's interesting. That's cool. Given the fact that now you're using it to play solo, what would you say are the differences between playing solo and playing in a like a social normal RPG? Well, the things that you've uh, noticed that, that are different when you play. Well, obviously, you can never replicate the dynamic of several thinking minds around a table. The things that arise from sessions like that are always going to be more surprising than just one mind, even with the emulator, right? Because the emulator 
is contingent upon one person's imagination. It's funny, my friend Ross back home, he watches my show and he says, you know, I love it, but he said, as a GM, I'm screaming at you going, no, 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 do this instead. Like, like interpret it this way because he's a GM. So that is the inherent limitation of the emulator is that you're still just one, you're just still the one set of experiences and memories and, and imagination uh, 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 elements that that's always going to produce similar results. But if you've got five people around a table, now you open that experience up to all these really surprising things for everybody. So I think that's probably the biggest difference. Um, also, I find myself way harder on myself when I'm alone than I do when I'm running a game. And I think it's because, <clears throat> A, I'm doing a show when I'm you know, so I'm, I'm very conscious of the technical considerations and the fact I have to keep the pacing up and all that stuff because it is a show. This is not, you know, I never made any, any, um, uh, claims that this was a tutorial or or anything other than just a show, right? It's not even supposed to be an accurate representation of what a game is like. <laughs> it is a show. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, that, um, is, is the first thing uh, and, and also I just find myself like when I'm, when I'm with a group of people, whether that's online or, or at home, I'm just, uh, I'm just able to kind of relax and improv a little easier. But with the emulator, I'm always trying to like, I'm always kind of second guessing myself. Like, is this the most interesting choice? Is this the most logical interpretation? And it says explicitly in the book, it, just go with your first thought. Go with your first instinct, and if it doesn't work, discard it and move on. But because I'm doing a show that's always sitting on my shoulder like a little devil going, hey, me, it's got to be really good. It's got to be the best thing ever. And I'm like, all right. Da -da -da -da. You know, so <laughs> that's probably the biggest thing is I feel f more relaxed when I'm with a group of people than I am just by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stress myself out, basically. <laughs> so I think I've already uh, gleaned the answer from what you said, but... Uh, do you play solo apart from from me myself and I? Uh, I only did it once, and I did it um, back when I was still sort of an, uh, a contributing member to one of the uh, the forums. The, the which one is a tabletop? The big purple they call it. It's uh, anyway. It's one of those big gaming forums. But <clears throat> I used to be on that forum quite a bit years ago. And I had discovered the emulator around this time. And me and a bunch of uh, people from all over had all sort of discovered the same thing and what we decided to do was kind of like an rpg thieves world experiment do you know anything about the thieves world series back in the day uh no i don't think so i'll give you the basic the basic pricey of this this was really cool so this is back in i, I think the early 80s um well, that, that's why i, I don't know it <laughs> i'm too young yeah there was there was a, a, a two authors, I believe it was two authors, and I could get all this, all, I could get all the details wrong, but just follow me on the, the, the basic gist. There was a couple of authors that wrote a book called Thieves World, and it basically, uh, what they did was they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to collectively create a setting, like a sword and sorcery setting. We're going to set it in this city, mostly, and we're going to each be responsible for a character, okay, that we're going to write. And we're going to put that, those characters in a shared setting. And other authors can come in and tell stories in that setting with their own characters. And when characters interact, you're allowed to use someone else's character in your own writing so that what you get is this sort of collective creation and you get this this uh, setting that's that's being fueled by the stories and imaginations of all these different authors. But they're all playing within the same rules. So we, there was, I think there was like seven of us that said, let's do the same thing with mythic. Let's all run games. And it doesn't even matter what the game is. I was using Savage World. Somebody else was using GURPS. You know what I mean? It was just like, it was irrelevant, but we, we all play our own games and we, and we, uh, transcribe the session and we post it on the forum so people could read it and go, okay, I know what happens here. And as we did that, someone created a wiki. And, uh, now if someone introduced a concept, like there's a new God or there's a mountain range or something, there's this wiki that shows all of this. So it, it was the setting that started to really quickly grow. And I, I was like, this is so wild. And what was really cool about it was that all of us had totally different writing styles. So some people would write very traditionally, like, you know, third person, you know, uh, Joe the fighter did this and then he did this. Um, other people would write from, you know, uh, like I, I wrote from the first person present. So my writing was always, you know, uh, I see him in front of me. I move towards him. I swing my sword at him. Uh, he's he's he goes down. Right. It was all very, very 
uh, stylized like that. But then we would write in when we would come to a point where there was a decision point, then there would be like brackets. Okay, so does does this uh, is there a, is there a treasure chest here? I think that's very likely. And then we'd record our roles and show what the outcome was, and then go right back into the into the pros, right? So it was really cool, and it lasted for a while. But then, as all good things do, it just sort of you know fizzled out because that's how it works. <clears throat> but I always thought back to that, and I was like, that was a really neat thing to do. And I'd love to, to, to start it up again. But honestly, the reason why I'm doing this show now uh, as a solo show is because, um, like I said in my introduction, I, I know Matt and those guys at Critical Role fairly well. I work with them on a lot of stuff. And, you know, I, I talked to Matt when he was first starting this thing, and no one had any idea that this was going <clears> to <throat> turn into what it turned into in terms of their, their show. But I always wanted to do something like it, but I didn't want to just do – you know, I didn't want to, oh, well, I'll get a bunch of other people and do a game and we'll film it because that's just, that's been done. You, the, those guys kind of got the lock on that and it's great. So I wanted to do something different and I thought, ah, well, if I do it just with me and I do a solo game, then I don't have to deal with anybody else's schedules. I don't have to deal with anything else other than me. And so, boom, out came Mythic. I was like, yes, of course, this is, this is totally the answer. And uh, it seems to be working well so far. Indeed, I mean, it, it, it's kind of exploded. So regarding the story, I've actually got some questions from, from the guys at the Discord, like the, this community of solo players. I was like, hey, I'm going to interview Trevor. What would you want me to, to ask him? So uh, oh, cool. one guy has asked me, um, how do you write your story? Like, do you actually write in bullet points? Do you novelize it? Do you watch your videos back? So when I sit down to record the session to play the game, <clears throat> I have no idea what's going to happen. Zero. Of course. All I know is what happened before. So it, I just use the mythic sheet, the worksheet, right, mm -hmm. that shows you scene by scene. And, and you know, you, you write down in point form what just happened. You, you write down the threads, the characters, the chaos factor, that kind of stuff. And then after it's all over, I've got sort of two artifacts that show what happened. A, I've got the mythic sheet with the details and b i've got the show itself so as i'm editing the show the story of what simon goes through is pretty embedded in my head because i have to watch i have to sit with him for 48 hours every time i do an episode and cut them together right uh so when i go to record the next episode what happened previously is very very fresh in my mind so i'm just able to immediately do a quick recap and get right into the next thing but i don't actually write a prose version of this i don't write anything other than just a series of chicken scrawl sc scratch notes scrawled along the uh the mythic worksheet basically that's very interesting that's cool another question was um which rpg systems do you think that work well with mythic but, but because of course that's a great I mean, one. The, the the thing of we all like the shiny things and we all got like 20 different systems different books that we want to test but the the solo interactions yeah. are different than when you are like gming or being a player so that's actually like an added layer yeah. of complexity yeah, it can be. That's that's a really excellent question. The reason why I went with Savage Worlds is because it's fast and I know it. Uh, I knew that I didn't want to use a system that I was unfamiliar with because that would be a nightmare. Uh, and I didn't want to use a system that was super crunchy because, again, this is designed to be a show, not a tutorial. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time having to explain to the audience how the game mechanics work. You know, like if we did... Oh, I don't know. Harn Master, which is one of my favorite games of all time. I I'm trying to imagine explaining to a viewing audience how a Harn Master combat works. It would be incomprehensible. <laughs> it would just be like, what? <laughs> and so he swings. There's all these crazy numbers and charts, and then he has no foot. Okay, well, I guess we'll go with that. So as much as I love that game, I'm like, I don't know if it's appropriate for this particular <clears throat> medium. It might be, you know, uh, depending on how, what goes with Simon of Argus, then uh, I might eventually do a, a Harn um, version of the show. We'll see. But the reason why I use the game system Savage World is because it's fast, it's furious, and it's fun, just to <laughs> use their <laughs> use their advertising slogan. Um, but I knew it, and I knew that it plays very quickly. And also, this is really important, uh, it, it allows me to handle multiple NPCs with ease, right? Like... The uh, Savage Worlds breaks down everybody into wild cards or extras, and most people are extras. And extras, if they get hit, they go down. That's all you really have to know. Um, so that works super well. I don't have to go through and like 
you know, if this was D and D three point five, for example, oh my god, can you imagine having to have the stats of everything and keeping track of hit points of it? Uh, and the fact it's just me running myself, and I've got six cameras running that I have to make sure are all synced up, and you know, not running out of film and blah 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 blah. So it's uh, that's why I, I'm super long winded today. I, I apologize, <laughs> but that's that's the answer. I use it because it's simple. It's true. I mean, the complexity of the system gets multiplied if you're actually being the GM and the player at the same time. And there are mechanics, like, for instance, um, there's this new Warhammer 40k game, which is called Wrath and Glory, which has got, like, yeah, I have it. N- not only, like, one mechanic for, like, general points that you have to have lying around. It has two or three. I don't remember exactly, but, I mean, that's, like, something that I'm not, e- not even going to bother trying to play solo. Because it, I have to, to book yeah. it like four or five quantities at the same time. Yeah. And there's a lot of games that have, I mean, you know how it works. All of these game companies, they all borrow from each other's mechanics. I mean, you look at D&D uh, 5, uh, 5e and it has borrowed a ton of mechanics from its predecessors, which I think is great. You know, everybody's sort of saying, oh, that's a good idea. We're going to pilfer it. Um, you know, uh, so with a game like Wrath and Glory, yeah, I, I mean, when I first, I was one of the first backers of it, and I, I bought the whole thing before it came out, and and when I got it, <clears throat> I mean, the core of the game is 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 solid. It's the editing is a disaster, unfortunately. Like uh, the game is incomprehensible in the book. There's rules that contradict themselves on the same page, uh, but the but the core of the game is fine. It's just yeah, when I look at it to use by myself in a solo game. Uh, there's no way I got to keep track of all these, di- you know, or, or even a game like one of the other games I thought about using ironically was burning wheel because burning wheel is entirely about the characters, but burning wheel mechanically masquerades is a very simple system, but it ain't. And, and you have to keep track of like three different types of fate points and you have to, tr- and it's just, there's, there's no way I can, I can do that and still concentrate on the show aspect of it, you know? I think we agree on that. Even though there are also people, people who are really like, oh my, my, my Pathfinder solo game is the best thing that happened to me. And hey, I mean, more power to you if that's your option. But I could never do it. Sure. Yeah. If if they can if they can make it work, that's awesome. Again, uh, I'm always looking at the limitations of my medium, which is this is a show that I'm putting up, and I have to be able to get through it quick. <laughs> Indeed. So another thing that people were interested in was, uh, the, apart from Mythic, the site tools and charts that you use. Um, I mean, I, I can name from memory uh, Perilous Wilds mm-hmm. and uh, the Universal NPC Emulator. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I've seen any other one, but I haven't watched the fourth there's, episode yet. There's Xanathar's Guide, which is from d and True, true for, for the character I, Life Path, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I introduce a new one in this episode coming up, actually, which is the random, I have it right here, the random, the random tables by Matt Davids. Um, again, these are just supplements that I happen to stumble across while perusing drive through essentially, or reviews, you know, form reviews and stuff like this. Perilous Wilds, first of all, uh, Dungeon World, I've had a blast with running for friends back home. Love it. Just, it's a very particular type of game, and I, I wouldn't want to apply that to all the games I run. I'm one of these guys that actually believes system matters, that that system does inform the the atmosphere of your game. <clears throat> so as much as I love Dungeon World, uh, I, I wouldn't use it for certain things. But So that's how I found Perilous Wilds, because it's connected to Dungeon World. And I looked at this and went, oh, well, I can just, this is just a series, this is just another way of generating random things. And I love that stuff anyway. But when it comes to actually running myself through this game in this show, well, that's a, it's a, it's a, such a gift to have those things so honestly i have so many supplements and so many game materials from 40 plus years of doing this just sitting around my my bookshelf i'll literally go through and go oh i haven't dusted this one off since 1987 let's see what's in here (laughs) pull it out and and there it is i'm I'm just seeing my future (laughs) uh do you actually (laughs) prefer to have pdfs or or like printed books I'm a dead tree product kind of guy if I can get my hands on a book. And I'll tell you why. Purely nostalgia. Uh, there's something about cracking a book. Up. Well, I never crack a book open because yeah. that damages the spine and I hate that. But opening a book and like smelling the glue. I'll tell you, my AD&D first edition books still smell like they did back in 1979. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. But uh, <laughs> but I can, I can flip open the DMG and read 
or, or attempt to find out how weapon speed rules work and still walk away with a headache. But uh, that still smells like 1979, baby. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and it did, there's something special about having the book. And like, if you're quickly consulting stuff, uh, I really also prefer printed books. I mean, for, for quick, like, oh, how does this rule work? The PDF is better. But just to enjoy the book as a product, I think that also, like, Printed materials is better. Yeah, yeah. PDFs are obviously very convenient, but uh, you know, I'm a '70s kid. I uh, I like my books. <laughs> now, going to another thing of the hobby, another aspect, which it's also a money sink. Um, what's your opinion between RPGs with minis and maps versus theater of the mind? So uh, here's another long-winded answer, but I like them both, and they they work differently and achieve different results. Obviously, theater of the mind is great. However, um, if you're dealing with a game that has any sense of tactics whatsoever, it's much easier to have some kind of representation. It doesn't have to be minis. You know, I have, I use minis and I, I build my own terrain and stuff. That's, that's new, by the way. I only started building my terrain this year. So I was like, oh, I can throw this in the show too. Um, <clears throat> but normally I just used a, a battle mat, the hex grid that I, with a, you know, uh, draw the stuff on and we used to use little colored bingo chips blue were for the PCs red were for everybody else so they had numbers on them with an arrow showing which way they were facing and that worked for us for years it was just fine um, but we needed that with a lot of tactical games because sometimes it's important if you're trying to hold the doorway against two enemies you need to know exactly where you're standing that kind of stuff not all games are like that like Dungeon World doesn't matter it's all up here and that's great um so I, I like both styles, but I find with the more players you have, especially in a game where combat is a pretty heavy feature, it really does help to have some kind of representation. Now, you can get bogged down, and ultimately this is the reason why I was sort of turned off D&D 3.5 is because they became hyper-focused on tactical details and where the minis were and stuff. And I'm like, okay, there comes a point where you're playing a tactical miniature war game. Um, incidentally, that's the other thing I loved about Dungeon World is that you know, there's a philosophy that says, uh, you know, you're playing a game and you're role playing in your character and all of a sudden the combat breaks out. And now, OK, now we're playing a board game, essentially move your guy here, move your piece here, do this thing, roll your dice. And then you're back to the character. So Dungeon World says, no, 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 no initiative. You just keep acting in character and what happens happens. And I love that it, every game and it doesn't work with every system. Um, but honestly, the only reason why I'm using miniatures and terrain here is because it's visual and this is a visual medium. I'm doing a show, so I want to have some, some visual representation and I'm kind of proud of the, of the terrain that I've learned how to build, <laughs> build this year. So I'm like, ah, I got to feature that. Yeah. yeah there's I, so I, many great YouTube videos out there that show you how to build it. I just, I love them. You were using the, uh, dungeon tiles for fifth edition. If I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, I, I for, think the, for the city, there. well, I mean, I think that they, for the town, that they actually, yeah, for, for town, I think that they actually produce them for fourth edition, but then they've just re-released them for fifth edition, but they are actually the same. Okay, because I bought mine again years ago, so I don't know. I don't remember where stuff comes from. <laughs> then it's probably from from fourth, yeah. What would you say is the like the the hardest thing to overcome or to decide when when playing solo? Because for instance, for me, it was uh, actually getting into the like mental state of okay i'm going to like play a store play a game in which a store is going to develop and i'm also going to have in my head at the same time being a gm uh, asking the oracles being the player thinking that for instance for me requires a lot of energy it's not something that i can do uh every day as i come back from from my work i'm destroyed my, my brain is melting so uh, right that kind of thing well, for me, that aspect is actually the enjoyable part because that, that's the creative outlet for me. So so I um, I like telling myself this story but not knowing where it's going to go. Uh, and, you know, I love coming up with characters on the fly. Obviously, that's what I do for a living. So that's, that's kind of second nature for me. Um, I'm trying to instill the characters with, with more – I'm trying to instill the NPCs with more – more characterization that isn't just based on a voice I'm doing, but that's that's a habit of mine that I'm trying to break. Honestly, that's that's part of the reason why I'm doing the show too is is to try and uh, uh, flesh out my characters a little 
a little more using the systems like UNE and stuff like that. Uh, how much success I'm going to have will time will tell, you know, again, I'm so I'm, there's a, such a time crunch when I'm doing this show that I kind of have to go on my instincts with everything. And sometimes what that means is that more details might suffer, um, just because I have to get through it. But, uh, the hardest thing to do is probably, um, motivate myself to sit down and do it. But I'll tell you something that actually has almost nothing to do with the game itself. That is, that is everything to do with the production. Like if this is, I, in order to do this show, I have to set up six different cameras. I have to make sure that they're all, you know, reasonably in focus. I have to make sure that the batteries are charged and, and I, I can only record for 29 minutes cause they're not video cameras. They're, they're DSLRs. They're still camera. Yeah. They're, yeah. So, Every twenty, I every twenty seven minutes, my alarm goes off, eh, 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 and I gotta go, and I gotta hit record and stop, and then play again, and then after that, I gotta go, and I gotta change out the batteries, and that really interrupts the flow of where I am, especially if I'm in the middle of a big fight. Okay, and then he swings the sword, and eh, 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 uh. there's no, you know, I don't have the option of going. Just hold on, just give me another minute. There isn't another minute. I have to go and stop, and then try and rekindle the energy as I begin the next take. So that is very challenging and that is very frustrating because <laughs> <laughs> well. I just I yeah I just want to be able to sit down and do it and then okay it's done and now I can cut it but no 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 it's you be creative in tiny tiny little um uh, chunks you know that's a very interesting insight from what happens in the background of, of the show um what's your like general opinion on, on rpg streaming like all of this craziness that has come with Critical Role, the Adventure Sound, the Glass Cannon podcast? Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, I, again, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, so the idea that people want to watch anyone else play a game is crazy to me. I'm like, wh- how is this entertaining? Because, you know, the things that we would never, ever, ever do back in the old days was subject anyone else to our gaming stories. There, there was no way. I mean, it, it, there was just... You had to be there, man. That's what it came down to. You had to be there. And now, everyone is there. They're actually there. It's like they're in the room. They're watching the, 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 the game. And I just think, I don't know why that's considered entertainment. I don't get it. <laughs> so for me... Like one of the options was, well, I'll live stream my my solo RPG, and I thought, no, that was going to put me to sleep. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> i i want to I want to have something that's watchable, something that moves fast. I mean, you can kind of tell in my show, I edit it in a very particular way. You know, I keep things moving forward because, um, to me, watching watching someone else play a game. Not all the time, but a lot of the times it's just like, oh, it's tough. You know, I will watch. I will watch other people's games, but it's almost always to learn the system. Like I used to watch uh, Adam Coble's Burning Wheel series he was doing um, <clears throat> uh, because I wanted to understand Burning Wheel better. Uh, Burning Wheel was always one of those games. I had had it for years, but every time I'd open it, I'd read three pages and then throw it across the room in frustration. Oh, this is too hard! Um, so, but I was like, no, no, I want to learn this. So I sat down and I watched a lot of his campaigns. And uh, a lot of it was great, but just watching someone else play to me is it's hard. That's very, very hard to do. Um, even the critical role guys, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I cannot watch critical role and it has nothing to do with the quality of their show. It's that I know these people. It's the same reason as I can't watch friends of mine who are in movies or on TV. Cause every time they walk on, on the screen playing a character, I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. Well there's Gary, you know, <laughs> it just, it takes me out of it. So that's why I can't watch critical role. Cause it's like, I can't, I work with these guys. I can't, I, no, I don't want to watch them do this. I want to play with them, but I don't want to watch them. <laughs> that, that's very cool because at, at first one would think that that all of you being actors, you would be like used to seeing the other one acting and, and yeah, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I love those guys and they're all super talented, but uh, I, I, I want to be at their table. I don't want to watch their table. <laughs> 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 have you ever played a like but i under I, but i understand i understand why other people do i totally get it you know i completely understand that it's just for me it's not sorry i could shut out there what, what, i don't what, know it's all right I, I was asking you if, if you've ever played with them like any rpg no um no i sat down with matt when i first got here 
uh, to LA six years ago because I'd heard that he was uh, he was a GM and open about it. It was very strange. <laughs> so I sat closet. down with him and I said, "Hey, man, yeah, I came out of the closet exactly." Uh, and um, and we we talked about it. We had lunch about it. But he was he was so busy. I was so busy with stuff. And and he I think he was just getting what would go on to become Critical Role started at the time. So it was it's an awkward time when someone is like ten sessions in with a group. It's it's an awkward time to try and come in at that point because they've already established their their boundaries, they've established their relationships, they've established the characters, you know. So it's like, oh, and now there's a new wheel we have to tack on to this rig. You know what I mean? It's it's so I you know, it, it didn't work out that way. They're always sort of like saying to me, hey, you know, we should have you on a guest star and do this thing, and I'm like, yeah, and then you know, schedules make it so that it didn't happen. But uh, uh, there's a lot of people in town that are are super into doing this kind of stuff. A lot of people, people that are surprising to me. Like I've I've had conversations with actors that I'm like, you, you want to play a get really? But I guess hey, if Vin Diesel plays D and D, then <laughs> indeed, yeah. I mean, I was gonna say you can tell me, and then I'm, I, I don't include it on the edition, but it's all right. <laughs> how long does it take you i mean more or less to like record and edit one episode of the, of the show so it takes me the setup is about two hours um <clears throat> that's to get the cameras up that's to get the 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 table up that's to get the miniatures ready uh, and i don't know what miniatures i'm going to need either that's the thing so so a lot of the times what'll happen in the show is i'll be recording it and then something will come up and you're fighting this creature like it happened in episode th- 3 was that the one where they went into the village with centipedes with yeah. the the crazy the centipedes yeah so when that happened i was like oh oh i have i have a miniature for this so i had to stop the cameras run into the house into my miniature collection grab these carrion crawlers and run out and start the whole thing over again um <clears throat> but it's about a 2 hour setup and then the shoot is like, well, I shoot probably an hour and a half of footage for each episode, sometimes two, and that takes about three hours to do. And then it's the transfer. I got to take all the footage and transfer to the computer, and that takes a couple hours. And then it's the first assemble edit, and that's the big one. That, that takes a while. That can take about five hours or so. And then there's the tweak edit. Then I go in and I make, I sync it or, or I, I, I tighten everything up and make sure that I, cause they'll, I'll shoot whole swaths of stuff that seem really cool. But then when I'm editing it, editing it, I realize, oh, this has nothing to do with the story at all. So it's <laughs> gotta go. There's huge whole outtakes of sections where Simon has gone off and done all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but it has nothing to do with anything else. So goodbye. And that, you know, that's like murdering your, your babies. It's <laughs> tough, but got to be done in the interest of <laughs> pacing. Uh, so, yeah, the the assemble edit is about five hours. The tweak edit tends to go a little sooner, and then I have to put music on it and effects and titles. So probably all in each episode is a good, solid, like, 48 hours well, worth of work. I mean, it pays off because definitely it looks very polished, but probably because it looks very polished, one wouldn't expect it to be that long of a work behind it, but... I mean, it takes a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's – well, I guess if it looks easy, that's that's the uh, that's the goal, right? To make it look effortless demands a lot of effort. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So congrats on that part. Well, thank you. One interesting thing that I, that I was very surprised at seeing how well you pulled it off, and it makes sense because you're a voice actor in your game, was um, the dialogues. I was actually mm. being interviewed by another channel some like a week ago, and, and they told me, well, I mean, yeah, you can play solo, but you don't act. You don't role play. Mm. I was like, well, no, of course I don't, because, I mean, I would suck at doing it. But, I, I mean, maybe someone does it. I don't know. And then I watched your video, and I was like, oh, well, yeah, this guy does it. He does it very well. Well, I, I kind of want to address that, actually. First of all, thank you for the compliment. But there is a, a bit of a myth out there that role playing equals acting and i think that with the rise of of shows like critical role and stuff where and myself where you have these professional actors doing this i think that with uh, the, the new gamers coming along who are introduced to games through these shows i think they might have a misconception that role playing equals acting but that is not the case at all role playing is literally just embodying a character who thinks or acts a, uh, a slight uh, slightly different than yourself or according to a, a set of character traits personality traits or maybe it is just an extension of yourself that's perfectly valid too but it does not require acting some of the best gms i've ever had 
have never acted today in their lives, but they're able to play characters using things other than, you know, whether they have an accent or whatever. No, they're, they're just, their attitude shifts or, <clears throat> you know, like with my buddy Ross, when he's running his Mithras game, if we're talking to the high priestess of the temple, uh, or then we're talking to the captain of the guard, two sort of main characters, um, they're very different, even though he sounds exactly the same. He doesn't change his voice or his accent, but he changes his rhythm or he changes his physical bearing or he changes the type of words that he uses. You know what I mean? So role playing has nothing to do with acting. I, I, I just I want to go on record as saying, you know, for all you new players out there, you do not have to be an actor. It is not an actor's game. It's a game for everybody who with an imagination. And that's all it takes. And and you're completely right on that. I mean, and that's indeed the, the the one of the bad parts of the rise of critical role and, and all of that stuff like that is that it's made people think like, oh, if, if I'm not Sam Regal, I'm not going to be able to play. I was actually pointing a bit more to the solo side of, or, well, actually to the recording a solo game part of things. Because when, when you're mm -hmm. with your friends, it's all right if you, if you just say, hey, the god tells you that you just kind of enter the castle without the head of the manticore. And then the other guy says, oh, well, uh, then my character is going to say that, well, you suck. I'm going to go to the other castle. <laughs> But if, if you're streaming your game, or well, if you're recording your game, and, and you act it out, I mean, even if you act it out, there is there's sort of this middle point when you're playing with people in which you can just be yourself and uh, you can tell that the god is, is saying something because you've changed something, as you've said. But if you're solo... I don't think that middle point is so easy to achieve because it's going to sound like yourself talking to yourself. Uh, it, it may be. I mean, that, that's possible. <clears throat> I mean, there's nothing wrong in solo play with just saying something like, uh, you know, my, you know, my character comes up and says, I want to present the head of the manticore to the, to the king. And, uh, uh, let's say he fails his persuasion role or whatever, however you're doing it. And then the guard says, no, get out of here. Like you don't actually have to play out that interaction. You can just say the guard denies you and uh, the guard denies him. Yeah. And, and right? I mean, to be honest, th this is more of a sort of, uh, thing that I've got in mind because I'm, I'm also thinking about starting like recording a game because some, some people have like requested it. And, and then oh, I think okay. like, how the F am I going to like do the dialogues? Because I can narrate, well, I think that I can narrate, um, I've got ideas, I know the game, but then when the dialogue part comes, how do I do it in a sort of like, uh, fun to watch way, which is fast, which is like everything that we talked about. So this is uh, like a super editing is your friend. thing. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Editing is your friend. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I, I don't know if I'll end up including this or not because it's such a really focused question of how do I stream solo games with dialogue that uh, nevertheless, it, it, it was something that well, I wanted I, to ask you. Yeah, I mean, I, I chose to do it in a particular way just because I'm trying to draw on my strengths. I know that I'm a voice actor. I know that I can play different characters and I know that I can invent them on the fly. Um, and I also know that I have multiple cameras. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have access to multiple cameras. So I can use the whole left camera, right camera thing to give the illusion that two people are talking to each other. And if I put an accent or a different voice on one character, then, okay, hopefully it's easier to follow saying what. But you don't have to do that, right? Like there are sections in my show, most of which get cut out, but there are sections where I basically just say he says this and then he says that and then they move on, right? Just because I'm trying to get past it. So it, it, it you don't necessarily have to live through every certain interaction, right? Um, and I know you know that as a GM, uh, but I wouldn't get hung up on it, honestly. I would just do whatever, like treat it like you would when you're running a group of people, you know? Just imagine how that character would respond. Okay, so if, you know, Joe's character was 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 challenged by a guard what would he say well i know that joe's character is really arrogant and haughty so he might say something like fine then well i'm taking you to the next castle and he says that and moving on like that's it that's all you need to do is just embody the character's traits so that the audience gets it oh okay yeah that's what joe would say moving on <laughs> you know that's a good one yeah that's true regarding general rpgs not not specifically solo what's your preferred genre of games i think if i had to pick a genre like if i had to say this is my favorite genre It would be like the Warhammer fantasy. It would be the dark, low fantasy, vaguely horror kind of fantasy. Um, that's what I tend to do 
best. It's what I tend to gravitate. It's what I tend to um, inject into all of my games, regardless of what it is. Like if I try and run a super high fantasy swords and sorcery, really heroic thing, and the players still wind up covered in feces and broke. Uh, uh, my players back home are, are always ribbing me about how in my games they are definitely going to be penniless, wounded, and depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of right. It always <laughs> turns out that way. But when they're not, they know they've worked for it. When cool. they actually come out of a situation with, oh my God, we made all this money and I've got these wicked magic items. Wow, we must have really earned that. Well, exactly. You earned it. Have you um, ever played that said, uh, I'm, I'm not... Shadow of the Demon Lord? Yes. Yes, Shadow of the Demon World or Demon Lord is is basically just the D and D version of Warhammer, right? So if, immediately I was like, "Yep, yeah, love this. Yep, yeah, it's great, awesome." And I had thought about doing that as uh, for the show as well, but that might actually be my second uh, series is Shadow of the Demon Lord, so I can really get into that, uh, really get into that horror thing. And the the system is so simple, you know. And again, as we talked about, that that's a hugely important factor in the show. So that's cool. That's very cool. I'm also uh, a very like dark fantasy guy, but my girlfriend's always like, I mean, if I wanted to be stressed out, I, w I wouldn't play a role playing game. I would live my life. So I never can play them. <laughs> yeah, that's what they all say. And then they sit down at your table and go, oh, wow. God, that was so good. I had, <laughs> I had friends when I was running the One Ring. Now, the One Ring is a game that takes place in Middle Earth. OK, so Middle Earth is not a dark fantasy, but mine was. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, they, I mean, and depending I mean, on the setting that you put it, I mean, if you go like to the north of the forest with the Witch King, and it, it can be done. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I'm not going to bore you with gaming stories, but just to give you an example of this. So our, our setting took place at the sort of recommended setting of the One Ring, which is five years after Smog has been killed. So it takes place in that 80 year period between the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. When... Mirkwood is darkening. That is literally the name of the campaign, the darkening of Mirkwood, and there's a reason for that. Um, and so the the characters all play characters that, you know, it spans 30 years of their lives. So these are people that get married, have kids, die, retire, have their children die. I mean, it's just, it's a big, big soap opera epic. Got to the point where my players and myself would be playing the session and everyone is glued to the screen because you know I'm they're all in one room back home but I'm on I'm here and I'm on this big monitor at the head of the table <clears throat> and they all tell me you know it's like we forget that you're not in the room like we're, we're just so engrossed in what's happening uh but but there's there's we'll finish a session and we all there's just this uh, because everyone's so tense and we're so emotionally exhausted after the sessions but they all say Oh my God, man, that's some of the best games we've ever played. But it's so hard. They would always say to me, it's so hard. It's so hard. We always lose everything we love, but they keep coming back. So, <laughs> Another very good system for uh, destroying the, the emotional stability of your players is 10 candles. <laughs> I don't know if you know it. I just bought that. It just arrived on my doorstep yesterday. That's hilarious. I mean, uh, if you ever get to play that, please record it because, I, again, I can play it with my friends because I don't want to destroy them. But if you destroy someone, I'd love to see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> Indeed. That's a hard one to play solo. That's a hard one to play by yourself. Uh, I'm actually thinking about it. Oh, of, yeah? Of course. I mean, you, you don't get the same... Um, emotional damage that you're going to get if you do it with people because they actually don't know where they're going. Uh, right. I mean, I would do it more for the narrative because it's got like very right. powerful resources like like the recording at the first and then the... Right. I don't know how I would do the candles. I probably wouldn't want to because I want to burn myself, but <laughs> I, I think it's a good system. Yeah, I'm going to check it out for sure. So there's a di there's a Discord site. Uh, I, I have to confess ignorance. I know nothing about Discord at all. <laughs> nothing. Oh well, I mean, let me give you like the, the brief thirty second elevator pitch. Um, Discord is like a service in which you can create a server, uh, which is basically a collection of both text and voice rooms, in which uh, you you have like moderator privileges. So basically, you can arrange whatever you want. I mean, um, for instance, the the mythic one is one that was. Uh, requested by people on the subreddit, the Mythic GME subreddit. And I, I'm a modern on that subreddit, so I was like, well, I'm going to create it because uh, who's going to do it? And it's sort of grown because I point the people from my videos to that server. And um, Panapigeon, the, the creator of Mythic, 
was nice enough to include my videos on the um, uh, word mill games, like the, the web page for the Mythic videos, for the Mythic uh, system, it's got a link to my videos. So it, 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 it acts sort of like a waterfall in which people go to Mythic, then they go to my videos, and they go to Discord. <clears throat> I would, uh, I would love, uh, you've just blown my mind. I didn't even know there was a mythic subreddit. I have no idea. I'm new to Reddit too. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm new to everything, man. Welcome to hell. But, uh, I'd, yeah, yeah. I'd, <laughs> so I've heard, uh, I'd, uh, I'd love to get in touch with the, with the creator of mythic. I think I, I, I tweeted at them or something, but uh, I don't know how to do that. So I'd love to talk to her. I'd love to talk to her because obviously she's the reason for this whole thing. Uh, or one of the main reasons for this whole thing. Um, and I don't even know if she knows about my show, you know? Like, I think... I don't know. I mean, um, I don't think she's very active on this stuff. There's the, the Yahoo mailing list, um, which is basically just a emails that people send that, that reach everyone, like a broadcast list. Um, but she's also appeared on the subreddit and not on the Discord, because that's, like, too far off. I noticed that She's just joined Twitter like a yeah. few weeks ago. I just saw that because I was searching for Mythic or whatever, and I came across, I was like, oh, oh, wow, she's even newer than I am. And that's hard to do because <laughs> I'm new at everything. <laughs> Technological. <laughs> <laughs> so you're sort of a Luddite. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Well, but at, at the same time, you've got a very good grip of like six cameras and editing for two days. So not not completely a Luddite. Well, that stuff I know, but but when it comes to how to upload it to YouTube, that took some research, you know, <laughs> or, or, or God forbid, uh, you know, how to talk about it on social media. I'm like, what, what, how do you, there's a, what, snap, d d what, who, tweet, tweets and face stuff, what? I'm just, you know, completely, you know, so I, I basically am like, you know what, I'm just going to put it out there. And if people talk about it, then they talk about it. But I'm not going to be one of these guys. Oh, my God, taking a selfie in my cell every day. And hey, look at this and come watch my show. I just, no, no, no. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it's super interesting how everyone brings their own experience and their own like life path to, to the same activity. Because, um, for instance, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm an engineer, PhD. So I do what I know best. I mean, I read a system, I summarize it, and I explain it in a very boring way. But people say, hey, you've explained it well. So it's cool. Right. So, uh, and at the same time, you're doing like this amazing show with, with full of voices, characters, glorious editing. So it, it, it's super interesting. Well, as long as people keep being entertained by it. I was actually concerned at the beginning. I was like... Because most of the shows that I watch on YouTube are tutorial based, right? This is how you do a thing. This is how you make a thing, whatever. And I was like, well, mine is not that, but I don't want to, I don't want to ignore that. So like, <clears throat> I knew that most people are not going to know Savage Worlds. So I knew that I had to put sums and that's where the titles came in. It was like, okay, so by the way, in Savage World, you roll a wild die with this and you know, honestly, I think that people who watch it, like the, my screen test audience who watches it, they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's helpful, but we don't know what's going on anyway. All we're really watching is you go back and forth and, and like put yourself through hell. And so that's all. I was like, okay, well, that's good that I, I guess that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that probably Savage Worlds is one of those systems that reaches sort of the equilibrium between you've got some crunch. So it, it's not Fate, for instance, which I love, but it's it's not a crunchy system. But at the same time, it allows you like some breathing space in which you can plug your acting and the, the, nar the narration. Right. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I don't really know. Are there a lot of other solo RPG shows out there? Um, well, I, I'm also kind of a Luddite in, in, in the process of knowing other stuff but i know that there's um, geek gamers which is a channel which has like a i don't know five million videos playing every kind of wow. system it, it's super interesting wow. and i've also been i mean i was asking the people on the discord hey who would you like me to offer to interview and they were like geek gamers please um there's also i used the well, artichoke dip that guy's more on on like reviewing and giving like random musings on on solo. There's also the solo RPG guy. I mean, uh, live plays. Um, there are none, and I mean there are none. There are some, but at your quality level of production, there's none. I mean that, that's why I said that you took the scene by a blast because 
it's basically taking the, the sort of super polished critical role um, product system or, or thing and bringing it to the solo environment in, in, in ways that I didn't even know was possible. Cool. Well, that's that's cool. It's good for you, you know, definitely. Has, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so to, to end up the interview, with going back to the solo thing, uh, have you tried uh, or tested other solo engines apart from Mythic? I've not, actually. Um, I've heard that they exist, but... Uh, Again, because I, I wasn't a big solo guy, I was like, oh, no, this, this tool is really cool and it does what I need it to do. Um, you know, obviously, I, I'm aware of certain things online that generate things randomly and everything. But, um, but no, what are, the other, what are the other engines out there? Well, I mean, the, like the, the elephant in the room would be Iron Sworn, which is a game that came out last year and it's free. And it's like a, it's like a packaged game in which it's uh, powered by the Apocalypse. Um, so oh, okay. it, it's like a prepackaged thing in which it, it sort of guides you to play solo. It's actually very good. It's very, very good. It, it won an Emmy last year. Oh, okay. So it's like a choose your own adventure kind of thing. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's got the depth of a role playing game because it's, uh, it's got the moves right. of, of Power by the Apocalypse. It's just that the solo stuff is sort of baked into the system. I mean, uh, when right. I did my introduction to solo RPGs, uh, I said that there are like two ways of, of playing solo. You've got like wrapper systems, which are things that you plug onto any kind of rule system, which would be Mythic and Savage Worlds. And then you've got like complete packages, which are games like Iron Sworn, Quill, That's or right. other stuff like that. So Iron Sworn, huh, I, I would say, is like the, the, the easiest way of playing solo. Uh, but for wrapper systems like Mythic, um, Mythic is definitely the, the granddaddy and, in my opinion, the best one. But there are others. Um, there's also... Um, was Mythic the first? It's the first that I know of. I mean, mm. I, I'm not a scholar on this, but uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of obsessed about it sometimes. And, and it, it's definitely the one that I know is the oldest one in terms of being like a GM emulator. You've got like uh, Tunnels and Trolls adventures from the 70s and the 80s. But, but they were, I think, sort of like choose your own adventure. Right. So, it's, I mean, it, it's definitely one, it's one rabbit hole inside of the rabbit hole, which is general RPGs. Right, right. A niche of a niche of a niche. <laughs> definitely. I mean, and, and it's one thing that when you explain it to other people who play RPGs, you feel like when people who play RPGs explain it to, the, to a person who don't. Like, oh, you do right. that. You, you do that kind of strange stuff. But is it even possible? Why don't you just play a video game? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. On the, that's the, the geek hierarchy, right? Where Basically. everybody thinks they're cooler than the, the person <laughs> that's doing the other thing. <laughs> Basically. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and end the interview here because it's been a, a lovely chat that uh, you're a busy person and I want to give you too much time here uh it's been well, a blast thank you. it's been a blast and then i really can't wait to see what the adventures of simon of simon of where argistan it's one of those things in which i mean i'm spanish so names in english if i don't see them written it's like i mean i i, I can sort of repeat it but i don't know how the f is written simon of argistan that's cool neither yeah neither i only saw it written once when i pulled it randomly out of a book <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know that we're in the same place yeah. <laughs> so, Trevor, thanks a lot. It, it, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I hope that, that your adventures thank take you very long. Thank you very much.